Making random connections with strangers through paintings has been the work of artists from the era of cavemen to present day. And Larry Walker, a visual artist, mentor, and retired art professor, has upheld that tradition with his mastery of composition, color, balance, scale, shadow, and light. Walker's multimedia paintings and collages invite viewers to lean in and take a closer look, but it's the existential expression that compels them to sit with the pieces in a wordless call and response. I'm Gail O'Neill. Join me and my producer, Felipe Barral, as Larry Walker talks about the art of making marks, discovery, and knowing when to back off on this episode of Collective Knowledge, because spreading knowledge is the most altruistic thing we can do as human beings. You believe in the power of art to attract people, engage their imagination, engage their intellects, to be in conversation with them, in a sense. Um, talk to me about that, where, you, where that idea came from and, and how you have seen it in practice over the years that you've been painting and making collage. Well, the, um, when I'm working on a piece, I'm giving it this or giving it that or making this suggestion or making this discovery mm. and all of that's happening here and, and somewhere along the way. Uh, it's a conversation I'm having with the piece starts to work and one piece might say hey you need something dark over here you do something dark over there mm -hmm. you need to get people back to this get yourself over to this side mm -hmm. do that uh, one, one of the things that I do traditionally now is I have things hang off the surface like, like that yes like that okay right. things are not contained only in the space mm -hmm. anyway those, those things that happens a lot. Um, somewhere along the way, the piece in this conversation I'm having with it, it starts to talk back and says, hey, Walker, I'm done. Leave me alone. Back off. Do you ever argue when the piece says I'm done and like you say, no, you're not, and you keep yeah. going? Yeah. And then what happens? Yeah. Well, one of us wins. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, when the piece says I'm done, and it, because when you're working on something, you, you constantly back away from it and look at it. Right. When you back away and look at it, that's when you're, um, you, you intellectualize about it. You think about it. You, you consider all of the design factors and color and the balance and all that stuff. Then you go back and you, you just back up and go back and do some more work. Right. Then you back off and look at it again. That's what happens in art classes. You do some work, you put it up, you have a critique. Mm -hmm. You get a lot, of, a lot of different eyes, a lot of different feelings, looking at the thing and talking about it. Well, once, once, you, once the piece says, I'm done, leave me alone, yeah. and you do that and you leave it alone, there it sits there, sitting there minding its own business. It should have its own sense of self, its own, its own life, its own, its own sense of destiny, so to speak. And if you choose then to put it in an exhibit, it sits there and it's waiting for the audience to come. Maybe some audience will just walk right by, don't even pay any attention to it, don't see it, don't think about it. Sometimes another person is walking by and the painting reaches out and says, come here, yeah. I'll talk to you. And you come a little closer and you start looking. There's some things in there that track your attention. This is, wow, you see what I did here? You see it's making you feel this. So the dialogue develops between you and it. In another, another situation, you walk by another painting or another person walks by another painting or even the same painting, and the painting reaches out and says, get your butt over here now. Okay, it just grabs you by the throat. Yeah, <laughs> pulls you in. Like Guernica, Picasso's Guernica pulls you into it yeah, and says, yeah. get in here and look at see what I'm doing. Right. You know Picasso's Guernica? Sure, yeah, yes. Okay. And it grabs you. Um, but and that's at, another kind of dialogue, you know. At that point, are you out of the conversation or are you oh, hanging you know, in the eaves and kind of, are you protected? It almost sounds the, like you're describing artist, children. You the raise them up of, the and then you let them go. The, they're out of the picture. Okay. So you don't feel protective of them? You don't? Feel like you have to control the conversation, or at least eavesdrop no. on the conversation, and make sure that your because babies I'm are. Because I'm not going to be sitting in the gallery every time, waiting for somebody to come in to to see the work. I won't even know that they were there. Yeah. 
And let's say you send me a note or something to that effect. So do you feel like there's any analogy between you have raised three children yeah. and you have painted paintings and, and in all cases you have to put them out into the world yeah. to stand on their own. Yeah. Is there an, an analogy there, do you think, to be made? I Probably because all of them, when they were young, were exposed to the arts. Mm -hmm. uh, got a note from my, my daughter, from California, my new, the one in New York daughter, just the other day because her granddaughter found these photographs and sent the photographs. And the photographs show uh, my youngest daughter, Kara, when she was a kid, mm -hmm. modeling for Shisato's class. Yeah. She was sitting up on a thing, you know. <laughs> and there's another photograph to where uh, the, she and uh, my, 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 two, my two daughters and my son were at an exhibit looking at work. Wow. And the exhibit that they were looking at was an exhibit of uh, art students who had been in my class. Mm -hmm. And we, we would do these exhibitions. They were all nude drawings of people. Right. And my, <laughs> my daughter says, you know, looking at these photos reminds me that we had a very unusual childhood. <laughs> <laughs> <And> <laughs> we were, <laughs> it's not every kid who who can uh, go to an exhibit with nude drawings on the wall yeah. and, and not be bothered by it. Right, that's right. <laughs> and not have people, not have their parents plugging them. Two of your children are artists. Yeah, and my And family. you have also mentored artists who have gone on to great commercial I've and critical artists, acclaim. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What did your mentees teach you in the process? But, uh, probably the, the greatest thing has been to help me realize that it's their life, their art, mm. their direction, their everything. Right. It's not about me, it's about them. So to help them draw, draw out from them what they have to offer and yeah, from there on. To get I've, 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 seen some, I've seen some teachers who kind of pound and pound and pound. They want people to do what they did. They want them to do it the way they did it. And that's not me. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's appropriate. I think you need to discover what this person has to offer and try to help nurture that along. And this person over here is offering something else, you can offer it, you nurture that along. If they have nothing to offer, then you try to encourage ways to get them to a point where they can have, where they do have something to offer. Right. Uh, that's probably what I've learned most. You were an academic, really, for all of your professional career until you retired and gave art a place of primacy again. So while you were teaching, were you making paintings at all, or did you just put that aside? No, no, I was always working. You were always working. Yeah, there, there were times when I would have to. Uh, uh, let the let the work set aside when I was doing something else because that happened mostly when I was doing administration, mm -hmm. which is time consuming, of course. Yeah. Yeah. When I uh, when I moved from when I was in California, I was I was at the University of Pacific for 19 years, seven of seven of those years I was a department chair, mm -hmm. and uh, I think my production slowed a little bit. But after, after I got out of the administration, I came to the realization that I missed it. There was something exciting about being in a position of making decisions and causing things to happen or <laughs> that kind of stuff, being the boss. Yeah. So I figured I needed to get back in. Tell me a story about that because I know you believe that <laughs> art can change people well, and change lives. I told a story lives. about that in the, in the, in the uh, video. I want to hear it now, so people who haven't seen that documentary can hear it. The story about the father and son. <laughs> or, tell, or tell me a different one. I can tell you about a painting you were working on in that documentary in which there was a little graphic from the podcast, Buried Truths. And I sent it to the person who created that podcast. And he was invigorated and excited. He was in conversation with that piece, even though he was only seeing it secondhand in the documentary that was made about you. I had an exhibit at uh, Camille Love's gallery. Uh, when she, she had a gallery up in Buckhead some several years ago. And uh, 
the exhibit I had was predominantly all uh, figurative things. And a couple of professors from the University of Georgia State went to the exhibit. One of them was a, uh, well, both of them were in the Department of Philosophy. Mm -hmm. And a few years after that, when I retired from Georgia State University, there was a, an exhibition of my work. And there was a little book that people could write in. And he wrote in my book. This, this philosophy professor wrote in the book that his father used to live with him. His father was getting up in age, he was cantankerous and mean-spirited and so forth, and he was causing all sorts of family problems. Yeah. And they just couldn't deal with it any longer. So they wound up putting him in a nursing home. And he would go and visit his father at the nursing home. And then each time after the visit, the father would say, when are we going home, sonny? Yeah. And he would not take him home. He just couldn't deal with that. And then he saw my exhibit at Camille Love's. He, he remembered seeing my exhibit at Camille Love's. And that uh, all those figures were so lonely and alone and emaciated and drying up and so mm -hmm. forth. And he started thinking about them and thinking about his father. So the next time he went to the visit his father, and his father says, okay, Sonny, when are we going home? He just packed him up and took him home. He said, and he was still a cantankerous, mean-spirited <laughs> old man, but <laughs> no longer, just he was so happy that he had done that because they got to know each other in a very different way. It probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. So the notion of, of the painting speaking to him uh, in such a way that caused him to do something that turned out to be positive in the long run it was interesting. Can you give me an example of a time when a painting caused you to do something differently or to look at something differently or to act differently because of what you had seen and experienced in that moment? Yeah. I was doing a painting, um, this was when I was in California. I was doing a painting, kind of a large, abstract-looking thing. And there was a little pot-bellied figure that kept showing up. He'd show up in these paintings. And initially, I thought, I'm trying to figure out, where does this come from? What is this about? You don't belong in this abstract painting. You're, you're a figure. So, I was working in the studio. I had a studio away from home on that, that occasion. Some, one Sunday morning I was working. And all of a sudden, like a bolt of lightning, it dawned on me what that was about. That figure was me searching for my father. Wow. My father died when I was six months old. I never knew him. I never had a father figure. So. And I sat there crying. I couldn't do anything. Yeah. And I went home and I told my wife about it. And I didn't talk about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I got past that because after that experience, it didn't bother me again. I could put a figure in wherever I wanted to put a figure in, and it was OK. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the figure is always. Whether it was an abstraction or not, the figure was there. Mm -hmm. It could be there. Mm -hmm. It could be there if I wanted to be there. And it kind of led to some of these things eventually where the shadow ultimately became part of the piece. Does artwork have to be beautiful? Artwork does not have to be beautiful. Why should it be beautiful? Artwork should be, uh, in some ways, it should have something to do with life, but it doesn't have to be beautiful. Right. It doesn't have to present life in a beautiful way. One, there was a movie years ago, I forget the name of it, but it depicted Edward G. Robinson. Just a name you probably don't know. I know that. I <laughs> see. That gangster who always had the big fat stogie in one side of his mouth. Anyway, I forget the name of the movie, but 
He's laying in a coffin. Mm -hmm. He's still alive. He's laying in the coffin, preparing to die, right? He's just laying there waiting for death to come upon him. And there's music playing and there's colors going back and forth, you know. It's like he's in this, in this place, trying, just waiting for death to come upon him. And it wasn't happening. <laughs> 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 um, so he was waiting for this pleasant life to be there, you know, this beautiful thing to happen, and it wasn't there at all. Uh, I probably never was going to get there. Soylent Green. Silent Green? Soylent. Soiling Green? S O Y L E N. Oh, Soylent? T. So Soylent. I've never heard of that movie. I think that was the name of the movie. You don't know it either. Huh? So do you feel like a part of you is also waiting for paradise, Larry? Waiting for no, something? No, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. So tell no, me what. No, no, I, I no. missed the point of the story then. You missed the point of the story? Yes, of the Edward G. Robinson. And no, what? you asked about does the painting have to be beautiful? Yeah. No, it doesn't have to be beautiful at all. It, it just be, has to represent something in life. Yeah. You know, when you look back in, back in history at, at artwork, most of the artwork was not about beauty. Mm -hmm. Some of it was, mm -hmm. because it was important for mankind or humankind to express something that implied beauty, but it was also important to express things that, that were uh, terrifying. It was also yeah. important to express things that uh, were mysterious. Or, um, uh, we go back to Guernica again. Yes. Okay, that's about war, about reactions to war. Or looking looking at the works of uh, um, uh, Elaine de Kooning mm -hmm. or uh, Rembrandt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or oh, Van Gogh. Van Gogh's okay. better. Van Gogh's. Mm -hmm. A lot of his things are about, you know, e emotions, mm -hmm. his own emotions, his feelings about things. For the, his feelings were about beauty, or mm -hmm. they were about. Um, sex or mm -hmm. about whatever the the expression of that thing was evident in the work, and that's what art should be. It should be an expression of of feelings, attitudes, not only about beauty it can be about beauty. When I look at these shadows, I think about how many of us walk through life, yeah. and our shadows might interact with the things that we're casting a shadow over, but we completely overlook it. Yeah. So can you give us, I want, this is where the collective knowledge comes in, three habits that people can cultivate so that we stop overlooking, whether it's art or nature or things that are right there in front of us, but that we just don't see. You're asking me to re-educate the person. Yeah. You're Which is very difficult to do right. because each person is a different person, yeah. which would may require three different or 16 or 20 or 500,000 different ways of dealing with, with everybody. There's no one way to get people to see and feel and so mm -hmm. forth. There are a whole variety of ways. Okay. How do you, do you have to remind yourself to see and feel? Yeah, yeah. Or is that, you do? Oh, yeah. Is there something you say to yourself? Hey, Walker, do this, do that. Hey, be sensitive. Yeah. Be concerned about what that person just said. Well, it may be different than what you think, mm -hmm. what you, how you would have done it, but does it have validity? Right. Probably has validity to them. Do you agree with it? Maybe not. Maybe you do. Maybe you should. There's lots of questions. Mm -hmm. In today's climate, there's so many questions you don't know what to do with all of them. Yeah. Today's climate, listening to uh, your president. Your president. <laughs> <laughs> Mine Somebody's left president. two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's very challenging, yeah. you know. One, there's something new every day, every week. There's a new I will say the beauty about being challenged is that I think artists tend to come to the fore. They tend to get inspired and they tend to get fired up and they're ready to go. 
Do you see that happening in the arts community? People responding to political imperatives or ugliness or rancor and just waking up and rising up and expressing themselves in a way they yeah. maybe didn't. That's true for some people. It's not true for all artists. Mm -hmm. It's true for some artists. Is it true for you? Probably not as true as it is for some others. Okay. Because I have, uh, when you look at all my stuff, it's not all political. It's not all social commentary. Some of it is, mm -hmm. but some of it's just pleasant. <laughs> Some of it is, uh, is more, um, there's a piece in, I don't know if you, did you see the things in the other room? I haven't been in the back room yet, no. There's a, there's a piece in the other room called um, Elegy, to, Elegy to Michael. Mm -hmm. And it's focused is on Michael Jackson. And uh, he's, he's there in the middle. There's a drawing. There's a there's a figure, kind of a mean spirited, evil looking figure, yeah. pushing this way and one pushing this way, and together, the edges of this figure and the edges of that figure create the image of Michael Jackson uh -huh. in the middle. So it's as though this musician had these evil forces pushing yeah. on both sides that help make him who he is or who he was. Yeah. There's a little, in, a little little collage element of him inside of Michael Jackson, inside the, the main image. And then there's a bunch of other characters. I call them wall spirits, but they're not. They're just mm -hmm. metamorphic images of birds and with beaks and stuff yeah. around. So the, the whole notion of, of this compression, this comp is there, and that has, um, it's not really political, it's not really um, horrific, although it's horrific enough, um, it's really about an expression of sadness. Mm -hmm. I'm having a visual of a diamond being formed by intense pressure, something beautiful coming out of a pressure cooker, essentially and that, that something being Michael Jackson. Hmm. What do you learn, Larry, when you walk around and you, you're surrounded by your artwork that represents the last, is this, what year did this uh, retrospective start? 2006. 2006 through 11. So. To 18. 2006, so 12 years. When you walk around, what do you see? What do you learn? What, what a do you hodgepodge of stuff have I done? What I have know. I done, oh my gosh. <laughs> Does your brain get tired, Larry, when I ask you all these questions and when you have to contemplate well, the work you've done? My brain's been tired for 10 years. And, and, so how do, you, how do you just relax your brain, just chill out? Uh, probably just watching TV, depending. What are you watching these days? What am I watching I these days? I hope you're not watching the news. That'll yeah. stress yeah, you out. Unfortunately, I've been watching the news. W <laughs> MSNBC a lot. Yeah. And occasionally I watch something else like those tough programs like The Closer and only that's gone off nowadays. Mm -hmm. Final question. Do you think societies have a cultural obligation to support the arts? Two-part question, really. Is it imperative that we support the arts? And are the arts a barometer of our cultures and our civilizations? I think the arts uh, reflect uh, a lot about every civilization throughout from the beginning, mm -hmm. including the work that the caveman did. Right. Okay. The caveman did drawings on the wall and scratching them in with, with the rock, you know, about hunting animals, about, you know, taking Making care fire. of family, you know. Yeah. Um, I think throughout, throughout history, there's been, the arts have played a role in reflecting something about the culture, something about the civilization. And I think it's important that we, we study that we, we, in order to understand what the culture was like and what the culture might have been or could become mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, I don't know that the first part of your question about 
is do we have an obligation to yeah who should support that art making should it be the responsibility of should it be a civic responsibility should it be through private patronage should artists just have to get out there and work at UPS by day and then paint at night whose responsibility is it to keep that that ecosystem alive and vibrant an artist is going to do what they do regardless of who's coming up with the funds mm -hmm. because what an artist does is not done for money it's done out of a sense of expediency uh, out of a sense of importance to that individual it has to be done they will do it and generally when they're doing it they're not thinking about oh am i going to pay get paid for this or am I gonna, you know they do it and we need to recognize that that just as just a musician will play music and they have to play music because it's important to them in terms of who they are and they're going to do it whether they're getting money for it or not whether there's an audience or not yeah yeah you know, people will do what they do mm -hmm. because of who they are mm -hmm. what they are and that's 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 one element what society has done over the over the years is taking all of these elements and put compact put them in the com, in a compartment yeah if you do this then you're that if you do this then you're that mm -hmm. okay so if you want to, you want to be a preacher you should have a church yeah if you want to be an artist you should have a job doing art yeah. if you want to be a cook you should have a you restaurant. Know, a restaurant mm -hmm. doing this. If you want to be a writer, you should have a publisher. Mm -hmm. We put we have all these compartments and and we've come to the point where if we don't have those compartments, we look down on mm -hmm. someone. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't have a publisher? Right. You can't be a writer. You don't have a gallery? Yeah. You know, you know you're no good. Right. You don't have a curator doing this? You're no good. You don't have a uh, whatever, you know. Then you put it in a broader sense, as you were alluding to, like, who's responsible for all of this? We're all responsible for all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's some there's some element out there that says, okay, we don't need to we don't need to put money in the arts. We need we just need to put money into the area where people are gonna be able to get jobs and so forth, and not the arts. Let, uh, let other people do that. Yeah. Let the entrepreneurs do that. I think people want to see a return on their investment, yeah. and it's hard to measure what the return is when somebody is creative and imaginative and, and, and creating something out of nothing. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Larry. Did I completely wear you out? Not yet. <laughs> well, then I'm going to walk you around so you can teach me some more. Thank you very much for doing this. Done? I appreciate it. Yeah, well, we're done with the interview portion, unless you want to tell me something else. No, oh, I don't know. I don't know. All right, so then let's walk around and you can just... Okay. Yeah, Felipe can get some B-roll. Coming up next on Collective Knowledge, Jennifer Barlament, Executive Director of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. I think it's incredibly motivating for you know, for a great community to have a great orchestra. Um, the thing that even people who don't know a lot about the technique behind performance, um, they can still uh, feel when a performance is searingly high energy. You know, they still can um, feel the vibe. There's, a, there's an energy and there's an um, excitement about perfection that comes across whether you understand how it's put together or not. Don't forget to share this episode, like us, or send us a comment. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and please subscribe to our channel on YouTube.